Good evening, folks. Welcome back to Project Liberation. I am your host, Rod, and this is my co-host, Chris, where we're going to try and make a safe space. And I say try because sometimes, well, for as much as we try, we can't be safe from ourselves. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to try and make a safe space for you guys. Uh, if you guys want to comment, uh, please feel free to do so through YouTube chat. Um we are more than happy to take your questions. I'm just turning that on right now. Uh, we'll take your questions. You don't have to give us a, uh, a regular name. Uh, if you don't want your question popped up on the screen for whatever reason, just give me a little hint so that we can read your question without reading your name or reading the, um, the, the you know, the whatever it is, is your identifier. Okay. Sound good? Groovy? All right. I'd love Rock to hear from you guys. and roll. All right. <clears throat> So on tonight's lesson, we're going to be talking about psilocybin. And, psilocybin. and for those of you not familiar with, with the medical term, it's psilocybin if you're Chris, and uh, magic mushrooms if you're anybody else. So uh, Chris, can, what can you tell us about magic mushrooms? Uh, psilocybin. So uh, there's a lot that I'll share as we go through this. Um, it's the medicine that I have had the most experience with. Um, quite honestly, I credit psilocybin as being the medicine that's helped me the most over the last 11 years. Um, in terms of where we're going, especially mm -hmm. looking at PTSD and everything else, uh, there are use cases that's very helpful. There are some that it's not. We're going to get into the pros and the cons. Why would you choose this over MDMA? Why would you choose MDMA over this? Why would you choose some other non-medicine therapy? Um, what I can say is it is one of the most versatile medicines out there, depending on the dose that you utilize, depending on the set and the setting, depending on the intention that you set. Um, it really behaves um, like very, mm, like multiple different types of medicines or experiences. Um, and then you can get into combinations of psilocybin and other medicines as well. Okay. The uh, you said you've been using it for the past 11 years. I'm sorry to interrupt. Have you been using it on a regular daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis? Do you go on it and off of it? Three Micro times dosing? a day. I'm highly addicted to it. I can't stop. <laughs> no, no, no. I hope that's um, not true. No, it's absolutely not true. So uh, I, I will make some jests here and there, but I'm going to make sure that we're also like get down to base truth. So um, psilocybin came into my life about... Mm, it was right at 11 years ago. Uh, and uh, the reason it did is I remember listening to uh, two people, actually, um, the Joe Rogan experience and some of the <laughs> experiences that they had with psilocybin and stuff. I think we might have um, just lost some viewers. Uh, sorry yeah. about that, folks. But Joe Rogan was not always anti-vaxxer or whatever 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, he was. I don't know. Uh, who knows what he was and, and who he is. It just it was something that I found really helpful and useful uh, at the time. And uh, and then uh, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss was open in some of his early days about uh, his utilization of it as a medicine as well. Mm -hmm. And then I began to just talk to some friends who'd had experiences with it because I didn't know anything about it. Uh, Rod and I have shared this multiple times, but we kind of grew up in the like, um, this is what your brain on drugs uh, looks like. Just say no era, uh, uh, Nancy Reagan. The just say no era. Um, and so I didn't really know a lot of people who used any real types of, of drugs that I was aware of other than uh, marijuana. Um, and I didn't know anybody who utilized these, especially for how I cared about them. I wasn't looking to just like have a good time. I wasn't looking to, to party. I wasn't even just looking to like trip my balls off. I, I wanted greater access to my mind, to my unconscious. I wanted to understand who I was. I wanted to understand why I acted the way I did. I wanted to understand as I got deeper, like why there were certain patterns in my life. I wanted to understand if I could rewrite those patterns. I wanted to understand um, what, what was beyond what I could see and feel and touch in this world. Um, I wanted to later on then find like deep, deep hurts within me and see if I could resolve those so that they were no longer triggers or hurting or 
causing me to behave in ways that I wasn't proud of. Um, and in all of those cases, it's been incredibly useful. And uh, it's not always the best medicine. So we'll start going through the, the presentation that Rod's pulled together. I'll share my anecdotes as we go through. Um, Rod may have an anecdote or two to share as well. Um, but the direction that I want to make sure that we are taking this particular show in uh, is not just here's the, all the ways that I've utilized psilocybin for healing or here's the good times that I've had on mushrooms or anything along those lines. It's really where might this be useful for you? How might this help you? When would it not be useful for you? Is this something worth shortlisting if you're currently having challenges with depression, suicide, PTSD, trauma, unresolved emotional experiences? Um, or are there other areas in your life as well that maybe once you move beyond some of the initial hurts, some of the initial traumas, uh, where it becomes an even more useful and powerful tool? So we'll get into all of that as we go through the episode. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. <clears throat> that reminds me, I got to click on the button here. So psilocybin therapy. Okay. So I'm the guy that does the research, right? So here's what therapy should be. Okay. Uh, therapy um, is psilocybin therapy is an approach being investigated for the treatment of mental health challenges. It combines pharmacological uh, pharmacological effects of psilocybin or the magic mushrooms, a psychoactive substance with psychological support. Psilocybin is, an, uh, is the active ingredient uh, in some species of mushrooms, often referred to as the magic mushrooms. That's all the magic mushroom jokes. Uh, <laughs> early studies uh, conducted in uh, pioneering academic centers uh, in, in quite a few universities from what I found from all the way back from 1996 to present. Um, a, a lot of state universities have been doing uh, psychedelic research, but this is one of the things that they've been uh, studying. Uh, it, they have found that it signals that psilocybin could be a safe and effective medicine for patients with depression, with anxiety, mm -hmm. and with addiction and other various mental illnesses that they went into. They, they tested it out for eating disorders and so forth. When administered with psychological support from specially trained therapists. Now that's the important part, right? The set and the setting. As I was uh, doing some of my research um, um, just for the show, I, I came across a couple of people that have tried uh, magic mushrooms, if you would, and um, they were a bit dismissive, right? Because their, their intentions weren't exactly uh, to, to better themselves at the time. Right. Yeah. It was just uh, they were using it in order to uh, escape from their uh, day to day lives. Um, and we have our first question from uh, JG. Uh, it says, <clears throat> and I quote. You stated there is a variety of uses and experiences one can have with psilocybin. With that in mind, is there any consistency with the experience if you wanted to repeat any experience? Um, you know, I've only done psilocybin once and I've microdosed a little bit. Chris, uh, do you have anything on this question? I do. I, I can answer. So, so there's uh, a couple different layers to this answer if we can start to get into it. So mm -hmm. one is, um, depending on the dose that's utilized, right? So I'm not going to give exact amounts, uh, because everybody and every body is different. Right. And so I don't want to just say an amount and then somebody goes out and tries that and has a very different experience. But we're going to say micro doses, small doses, medium doses, large doses. Like we can break it down in that way. Um, many of the micro dose experiences you'll find more consistency to. Right. And I believe that you find more consistency because you're taking such a small amount of it. It's just barely perceptible. The way a microdose works is you take it and it's just barely perceptible. You're not trying to have an experience with it. You're just trying to affect your nervous system, your brain, um, even your moods and everything else at a subtle level. But with that subtle upshift. And I know, Rod, you can speak to some of the benefits of that when we get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, as you start to go up. And say, look at a small dose. The small doses, again, you're going to find some level of consistency with them. And that's because uh, the amount of medicine that you're having and your control over the experience 
um, it tends to be pretty, um, you have more control with it. The way I've often described it is at lower doses uh, of most psychedelics, uh, but especially mushrooms, um, at lower doses, it's like you're dancing and you're leading you know, uh, the experience. You're the one kind of in charge of where it goes. The higher the dose gets, the less you're in control, the more that the medicine is dancing you, if we want to use that particular analogy. Um, the deeper you get into true psychedelic experiences that involve releasing uh, control, that involve surrendering, I know it's not like the uh, letting go, let's use the word letting go instead of surrendering, right? Because of the connotations involved that involve letting go. Um, you're going to find that those can vary dramatically, right? Because they vary based off of where you are psychologically at the time, who you are at that point in time, right? Keep in mind that the person you were uh, a month ago or a year ago is not the same person who is right, right here, right now. Um, and you're going to find a wide variety in what those experiences might be. There might be similar flavors or notes to it, uh, but where it's going to take you, what that experience is going to be, whether it's going to be visual or not visual, whether it's going to be deeply somatic and you're going to feel like your emotions deeply or you're not going to, whether um, it's going to be a quote unquote good trip or quote unquote bad trip, um, whether or not uh, you're going to have a sublime uh, connecting with the universe experience or not, like you don't know. That's one of the interesting and at times can be challenging things with psychedelics is once you've taken the dose, you don't know where it's going to go. That's why it's a letting go experience. You are um, allowing your ego to stop being in control and then to go on the experience that the medicine is bringing you. So the, the, the answer kind of bringing it back around is at lower doses, there's more consistency to the experience. And you can kind of expect like from experience to experience, it's going to be a particular way. Once you know how you interact with this particular medicine at higher dosages, it's going to be a different experience every time. Right. Um, and that's part of the thing that can be challenging with it. But quite honestly, that's part of the benefit of it because it's taking you very often where you need to go rather than where your mind thinks you need to go. Those are two very different things. Thank you. I, I can speak a little bit about the microdosing. I, I microdosed there for, for a little blip in time. Um, what I found was uh, with the microdose I was taking of psilocybin, I tended to feel more alert. Like I had a really good night's sleep the, the day before and I was just very awake. My, my, brain, my brain, my brain worked just a little bit faster. Things came a, a little bit easier. Um, yeah, uh, I, I breath came in a little, a little bit crisp. Uh, you know, it just uh, I, w I just felt more alert. If I could put a word to it, that would be it right there. Just the, an alertness to it when I microdosed. I didn't really notice any of these effects until I ran out. <laughs> so it's kind of like, oh, wait a minute. I guess it was helping me. You know, I didn't feel as anxious. I, I felt more um, confident. I felt quicker uh, of wit and, and brain power. I felt like I had a little bit more bandwidth. Um, it just, uh, it, it was, it was quite interesting to see that. Um, and again, I, I didn't, I didn't really notice it until I, I, I ran out of the microdoses and then the sluggishness started coming back in. And I was like, oh, I guess it was doing something because initially I didn't think it was doing much for me at all. Uh, but uh, again. Um, really not paying attention until after the fact. Uh, one other thing uh, I'll get into is since we're just already on microdosing is, is number one, with all the research that I've seen, and there could be something else out there, there always is, uh, but uh, it's not habit forming, right? So you don't have to worry about uh, habit with it. There is tolerances that build up, which is why Fadiman built a protocol, which is essentially like once every three to four days is the protocol that's utilized if you're, um, if you're going to microdose. Uh, Microdosing, some people literally have done it for a week, and that's all that they've done. Some people have done it for months. Some people have done it for years uh, with no observable ill effects. Okay. Um, no withdrawals. Kind of, yeah, no withdrawals. Like there, there's literally no withdrawals to it. There's no addiction to it. There's no like long term like neurological effects. Like the neurological effects to it seem to be that it promotes um, neurogenesis, i.e., the uh, rewiring of the brain and the creation of new nerve cells. Um, yeah. So if you talk about a, a side effect and then experience I've often had in terms of like mood uplifting, 
uh, when I was, and there were times and periods of my life, especially when I was having more challenges with, uh, with depression, where I would find it mood uplifting. Uh, and it was very, very beneficial for that. And then secondarily, I would notice that just for whatever reason, it's like colors seem just a little bit more vivid. Um, the, 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 the world around me was just a little bit brighter, not like blah, like some you know, amazing Hollywood movie filter or Instagram filter, but just, just a little bit turned up. And I noticed I had a little more joy in my heart. Um, and that was some of the benefits that I received from it when I was doing that at the time. Hmm. I wonder if the world seemed a little bit brighter just because the, uh, the the cloud of depression, if you would, had just lifted up a little bit and just allowed you to take that in. I, I know that sometimes when we're a little, I, I get a little down whenever it's it's a cloudy day or anything like that. And I notice that everything around me is just a little bit dimmer. So if I go around the house and I turn on the lights and, and, and whatnot, and I don't, realize it's cloudy or foggy outside and i feel a little bit better but you know given <clears throat> given the option you know it's kind of like huh i wonder if that cloud gets lifted just a little bit um when when you are microdosing um, yeah 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 I, I believe that that's right it does and and i've also microdosed when i wasn't experiencing that and i, I uh -huh. still had that same kind of like brightness like show up um okay. But uh, I think that what you're describing, especially when it comes to like that cloud of depression is there when you literally gave the visual of it's like it's a cloudy day outside. And you turn on your lights and your living room's a bit brighter. Like that's a great way to describe what the experience was. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So research uh, as of 2020 results from preliminary research conducted on psilocybin therapy include uh, effects on anxiety and depression in people with uh, cancer diagnosis and effects on alcohol use disorder, uh, that's uh, addiction to alcohol. Uh, research has also been conducted on psilocybin therapy for the treatment of migraines and cluster headaches. Uh, like I said, they, they found it to, to be uh, just oddly beneficial. Um, and, and I gotta say, um, there's a little bit of alcoholism on my family. Uh, mm. you know, and so I've always been very weary of becoming an addict myself, just always just kind of kept tabs on it, uh, for fear of, of going down that, uh, that spiral, uh, myself. Um, I'm not saying I, I, I've never been a drinker. I have been a drinker. Um, my tolerance was high. Um, you know, what, uh, what could affect the normal person, uh, me being a bigger guy. Um, it didn't always affect me. So I would, I would have to maybe drink a little bit more to get that same buzz as, as somebody else. Um, but I did notice that after my psilocybin experience, I no longer craved alcohol, oddly enough. Mm. Uh, where before uh, I, I would sip a little whiskey uh, on a regular basis, uh, just to kind of calm me down in the evening sometimes or at the end of the week. Um, Never too much, again, because I always fear getting out of control uh, with that kind of thing. But I always, you know, it's like when you watch the movies and it's like, oh, it's the manly thing to do to, to, to sip on a little whiskey in the evenings or anything mm -hmm. like that. I always took it like that. And I did notice that uh, with having taken the psilocybin and, and then coming back home in my regular everyday life, I no longer have that necessity. So I guess there is something to, to, uh, to it with the, uh, yeah, not wanting to uh, partake in alcohol as much. So interestingly, and I think it, it may go beyond there because, um, so I've never really been like that drawn to alcohol. So I haven't had the same experience with alcohol, but where I did have it of all things was like sugar. And, and in particular, like I ha used to love gummies, like give me some gummies and give me like a one pound bag. And that's a single serving. Right. Um, and there have been, times like like literally i remember like uh in the midst of a psilocybin session like oh, i'll just well, i'll try this and then like eating i'm like oh, this doesn't taste good and it wasn't like it tasted bad or anything else it's like this like the, the thing that attracted me to it wasn't there anymore mm -hmm. and then like i just didn't feel the the need to go back to those things so mm -hmm. and I, I can tell like for me like like there was a bit of the using the sugar uh, and then also like the memory of gummy bears and stuff like that from being a kid, like using that to kind of like fill a bit of a hole 
Um, yeah. And then there was just no reason to fill that hole anymore. It wasn't necessary. So your emotional eating. Uh, <laughs> yes, went my away. emotional eating was, was yeah. affected by, not completely gone mm. away, right? But it was, right. it was affected. And yeah. I just found myself without trying, like I'm going to diet. I found myself eating in a more healthy way because I was being drawn towards foods that were actually healthier for me. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It it uh, it reminds me of a and, and I don't know if there's copyright on this. It reminds me of an episode of Futurama where yeah. uh, the, the main character uh, gets a uh, tuna fish sandwich out of a out of a vending machine that's like expired, and he and he ends up eating all these uh, little bacteria, if you would, that end yeah. up uh, going into his body and making it better. Yeah. Well, but that's a lot of the way. So 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 when we start talking about like psilocybin, you have to like get into the fact that like if you talk about mushrooms in general, right? There are so many mushrooms. You've got lion's mane, you've got reishi, um, uh, changa, uh, chaga, I believe it's chaga. But all of these like mushrooms and everything else, um, turkey tail, um, have <laughs> profound effects within the body. Like turkey tail is great for the immune system. Um, lion's mane helps with uh, nerve repair and neurogenesis and, and thinking and everything else. Hmm. Um, and so the there are some mushrooms i'm trying to think of one offhand right now and i'm failing in this moment it might be ashw you know i'm failing in this moment but there are some mushrooms that are adaptogens what that means is when you take it you eat it it actually reacts differently in the body based off of what the body's needs are hmm. and so something that i found interesting about psilocybin my experience with psilocybin is that it is a bit of an adaptogen then that's why set and setting and intention are so powerful because, uh, and that's why your experiences can differ so much because the intention and the energy that you bring to it, um, and the setting around it is going to have a profound effect on the experience that you have. And this is my personal belief. I can't back this up with, with research or anything else. So just, you know, grain of salt. This is what plow is saying. Um, I believe it does do that kind of thing. Like, you know, your body needs certain things. Your psyche needs certain things. You know, your yeah. emotional body needs certain things. And it's going in and helping in those areas that actually need the help. Pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. Yeah. No, I, I, as I remember in that episode, they actually made him smarter, stronger, and faster, like the, you know, $6 million man. <laughs> and I was like, huh. <laughs> and I've always like, hmm. Can you put those magic mushrooms on a pizza and will it have the same effect? <laughs> yeah, just, just a thought. Food for thought. <laughs> and we have a question from Mr. JG again. Let me see if I can post it up here now. It says, dun, dun, dun. So far, you've discussed some of the potentially positive unintended bodily side effects. Are there any known negative unintended side effects? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, from my experience, and, and I'd really love to see if, if Rod's research has turned up anything. From my experience, uh, no. So you can't overdose, like physically, like eat, eat enough to be able to overdose. If you, like, I'm sure there's some way some human could find to overdose because we're incredibly inventive. But you can't overdose on it. Um, a lot of people have the oogie boogies in their belly well, when they have it. So their, their, their belly can get a bit like raw, raw, raw. Is that a technical um, term, the oogie boogies? Yeah, the oogie boogies. Um, that can be common for a lot of people. It's not something I typically experience, but it can be common for people. Um, I'm not aware of any negative effects on the body in terms of like, because um, it's not addictive. Uh, not like it, it's going to, you know, like when you get the prescription uh, bottle of medicine and it's got like the small print and you're reading the small yeah. print and it's like may cause heart attacks, death, um, you know, your hair to fall out uh your testicles to drop like you know just all, all the good things, things in life i'm not actually aware of that with it kind of like cannabis you know cannabis has um a few if any side effects unless you have some type of like allergy or something else to it right. uh, and my understanding currently with everything that i know about uh magic mushroom psilocybin is that it is in that same way right now i do have to warn people depending on your state and this is state by state uh it could lead to bodily incarceration Yes. Okay. So that is, a, so you're, you're having a bad experience that could be traumatic. This is again, we want to be careful. So the emotional effects of it and the legal effects of use this only someplace legal again, your responsibility, right? Right. You do not want to end up in jail. No bad 
Nobody wants that. Right. You also don't want to have, again, this is why set setting, making sure you're ready for an experience like this, working with a practitioner, all of those things is so important because it's not just that you take this and everything is going to be great, right? Like there is care to be taken. That's why in the old indigenous uh, uh, you know, eras, you had shamans, you had guides, you had people that would help you take this. It's right. that way for a reason. You don't want to do something that's going to cause um, some type of emotional scarring or trauma. Um, and so that's where it is definitely worth care. The only state that has legalized psilocybin for recreational use, if you would, has been Oregon. Uh, currently, there is uh, something in the... Uh, in the Washington legislature, that's Washington, Washington State, not D.C., where they want to legalize it for uh, recreational use. Uh, some other states, I live in New Mexico, yours might be different. Uh, it has been decriminalized. Uh, for example, in the state of New Mexico, uh, you're free to grow it. Uh, you're free to consume it. You're free to, um, you know, party with it if you would. However, once you dry it up and try to sell it, now it's a crime. So you're not free to sell it and you're not technically free to dry it, uh, even though that was challenged in uh, 2015 in my state uh, by somebody that just uh, dried them out to the sun, uh, apparently. So if nature can do it, uh, it's not illegal. Oh, However, interesting. Nature cannot sell it. And that might be because we do have a lot of Native American tribes in New Mexico that still use it in ceremony here. Um, again, um, check your state for the legalities of it. Uh, we don't want anybody to go to jail when they're trying to uh, fix their themselves and their psyche. Okay. So yeah. be very and, careful. And, uh, I also understand it's been decriminalized in Florida simply because, uh, and don't take my word for it. This is just research. Apparently it just grows wild out there. It's nice, mm -hmm. humid. Uh, and if you have cows nearby, chances are you pick up a patty, you're going to find them. So uh, you're going to find some shrooms. Yeah, so, so there's actually a lot of states where you can uh, wander around and just happen upon, um, you know, these uh, particular mushrooms. It's, it's interesting that way. Right. Um, and again, we're going to talk more about, we'll get deeper again as we do in some of these episodes around what set, setting and intention mean. Um, while I'm, I'm making light of some of this. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to interject a disclaimer before we, we, we go. Don't go out there and find a mushroom and stick it in your mouth. If you don't know no. what it is. No, 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 no. Many of them are poisonous. Poisonous as in kill you poisonous. Yes. Yep. So you may not be able to OD from a magic mushroom and psilocybin, but you can die if you eat something that you don't know what it is. Okay. Yes. So don't go out there lifting up cow patties, looking around the band, like, oh, here's this room. Well, bad idea. If you don't know yeah. what it is, don't put it in your mouth. Just the, it's a good general rule of life. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad we have you on this show to be that voice of reason. Uh, I wouldn't do that, but I didn't even think to say that. So thank you. You're welcome. And, and I'm sorry for having inter inter interrupted. No, it's perfect. Uh, I'm going to add more context as we go through. So, so uh, go ahead and jump on to our <laughs> next beautiful slide. All right. So how it works. Uh, the molecular structure of psilocybin, a naturally occurring psychedelic compound found in magic mushrooms, allows it to penetrate the central nervous system, and the scientific and medical experts are just beginning to understand its effects on the brain and mind and its potential uh, as uh, therapeutics for mental illness. Psilocybin produces visual and auditory hallucinations. Who said that? Uh, and profound changes... <laughs> in consciousness over a few hours after ingestion so if you eat one and nothing happens don't eat five more give it a minute wait all right? wait wait, <laughs> wait. Yeah, exactly uh, uh there, there so there hold on there there is a rule here that i'm always going i'll just like say now because we're at this point sure you cannot eat less like any type of anything that you ingest if it's a medicine or whatever else you can take less uh, you, sorry, you can always take more, but you can't take less, right? right? So don't just shove a whole bunch more in your mouth. Like, 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 give it a time. It can take an hour or so for things to like, like, take on. And again, we're going to come back to it. Do this under guidance. Whether yeah. this is truly an experienced 
truly experienced shaman, whether it's a therapeutic setting and it's a, a, a therapist who's alongside of it, who has experience with psychedelics, whatever this is, like step in with somebody who's going to care for you. Give yourself that particular care, that freedom, that, that lack of worry. Go into it in that way. Yeah. And to finish up the slide, uh, in 2016, John Hopkins and medical researchers found and reported that the treatment with psilocybin under psychologically supported conditions, meaning they had a, a doctor of mental health nearby, uh, significantly relieved uh, existential anxiety and depression in people with life-threatening cancer diagnosis. All right. So... so yeah, sorry to jump in. I, I love this particular, um, uh, this research and this study that was done. Yeah. So you're taking people who are at the end of their life. And of course, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear that comes with uh, the end of life. And they essentially gave them mushrooms, right? Or placebo. It's a little interesting how you do a placebo study when the effects of mushrooms can be, like, you know, pretty profound. But there are ways to do that. Um, they give them portobello mushrooms. Yeah, portobello. I think they often use niacin because it promotes uh, flushing. But um, regardless, doesn't matter. Um, the experience that many of the people have, and I don't have the exact percentage, you have to look at the study, but the many, 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 the, the vast majority of the people had was one that brought them to what they would call one of the most profound experiences of their life, often one of the most spiritually profound experiences of their life. But what that gave them Imagine people who are near the end of their life, the anxiety, the fear that comes with that. It gave them this sense that it's all going to be okay. It allowed them to rest easy knowing that they were going to pass, right? And while this isn't a, a direct correlation to other things in life, whether we're talking about depression, suicide, PTSD, think of just the power of this medicine to allow people to rest easy in their last weeks or months in life. And all the joy they could then experience, all the memories they could form with the people who love them, all the ease with which they get to pass from this realm, rather than being racked with anxiety and fear and all the other things that come in. Like, what an incredible service that could be offered for people. And uh, from my experience, it's definitely a, a spiritual ex um, awakening almost. And uh, I, I got to say, I've never been a religious person. I was uh, raised Roman Catholic. And uh, as soon as I was old enough, I left that behind me. Um, but having experience um, uh, psilocybin, I, I got to say, um, I, I felt that I had a not religious, but a very spiritual experience which kind of allowed me to put a new perspective in life and uh, has allowed me to, uh, to just be a little bit more at ease with, uh, with the daily tribulations, if you would. Um, you know, I, I, again, it's, it's not a permanent feeling. Uh, it's been a while, but I still feel that I can now um, take things as they come a little bit easier, well, a lot easier than what I used to. And uh, having had PTSD for many, many years, um, that was uh, always a challenge for me. And it's, it's kind of nice that it, uh, it no longer is. Thank you. Legality. Here's where we were talking about. <clears throat> In the Do United States. Do not go to jail. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a rule number one. Don't go to jail. Uh, in the U.S., uh, psilocybin is considered a Schedule I substance under the Federal Controlled Substances Act, uh, which will define it as having substantial potential use for abuse, uh, absence of adequate safety evidence, and not currently accepted as a clinical use uh, of a clinical used therapeutic medicine. That is changing. All right, uh, many states uh, where personal use uh, are now allowing for personal use. Check your state. OK, check your state. Uh, and it's been decriminalized. OK, uh, the state of Oregon has actually legalized it um, where you can actually um, much like uh, um, cannabis in a lot of states, you can actually go out and, and get you some psilocybin. OK, there are many other states currently pushing for decriminalization and legalization. Uh, the only one that I'm aware of that's that's currently going through that. It's the state of Washington. And again, Check your state. 
Um, check your state, check your state, make sure that you are on the right side of the law when it comes to that. Uh, some things may be legal with it, some things may not be legal with it. Um, again, if you are attempting to sell it uh, where it's been decriminalized in some states, that might still be illegal, okay? The decriminalization doesn't mean it's legal. It just means uh, you are allowed uh, to uh, maybe grow it or have it. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, decriminalization very often, because I believe it's decriminalized in Denver as well, not Colorado, but Denver, right? right? Um, <clears throat> and it usually just means that um, the police officers are not incented to come after you for it, right? But it becomes, it still can be a bit of a gray area. It sounds like New Mexico is um, better with this, excuse me, than some other places. Uh, but really understand your laws because being on this side of the bars is a hell of a lot better. We don't want to be on the opposite side. <clears throat> so a little bit of history with the psilocybin. Of course, it's probably older than the human um, race itself. Uh, if you ever watch, it watched... might be responsible for uh, the rapid growth of the human brain. If you have ever looked up the Stone Ape theory, That's, the Stone uh, Ape something... theory, uh, a great uh, documentary out there is on Netflix. Uh, it is called Fantastic Fungi. Yeah. Uh, that's F U N G I, not like a fun guy, but uh, as in the fungus. Um, where it actually talks about the history of psilocybin and the stone ape theory, and it brings it all the way up to the present, which is, it's just beautiful. They, they have a guy up there in Canada that, uh, actually, uh, grows it and he owns a, a business around it. And he tells his story about ingesting way too much, uh, and having, uh, quite the experience. But <clears throat> as far as for psychotherapy, the history goes, in 59, there was a guy named Albert Hoffman. Uh, he was a Swiss chemist. They're always Swiss for some reason. Uh, the first person to extract pure psilocybin from mushroom, Psilocybe Mexicana. Sandoz, the, uh, the company that employed Hoffman, then began to sell the active compound in clinic, uh, to clinicians as an aid for psychedelic psychotherapy. So it was already being used. In August of 1960, Timothy Leary, uh, let me know if you heard that name right, uh, conducted a self-experiment using psilocybin mushrooms. After trying pure extracted psilocybin, he, he and Dr. Richard Alpert tested whether it could help reduce uh, recidivism rate and constitute an effective psychotherapy aid. In 63, both Leary and Albert were suspended from their jobs at Harvard University. They didn't come back. Uh, due to irresponsible and dangerous experimentation with psilocybin mushrooms. Psilocybin research in the U.S. ended in 1970 when the, U the use and possession of psilocybin mushrooms became illegal. Remember the summer of 69? All those hippies? Yeah. Well... We got to put a stop to all them hippies, right? Wanting to stop our wars and questioning what the government's doing. So that's what happened there. Uh, and between 19, I'm sorry, between 2018 and 2019, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, go to FDA, granted breakthrough therapy designation to fa facilitate further research for psilocybin in the possible treatment of depressive disorders. As of 2020, research on the use of psilocybin indicated it caused hallucinations with inability to establish reality from fantasy, bad trip, panic reactions, and possible psychosis at high doses. Now, here's the other part. Most people come back, come back down from that. That's just, you ate way too much of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. In November of 2020, the U.S. state of Oregon legalized psilocybin for people uh, uh, 21 and older and decriminalized possession or use of psilocybin mushrooms for medical conditions such as depression, anxiety, or PTSD. I looked, I looked, I looked, but I was unable to find more research on PTSD other than this brief mention. Yeah, we're going to, uh, let's just address this here, I think, um, unless there's a better place to. Um, psilocybin has a lot of uses. It has a lot of uses when it comes to anxiety, it has a lot of uses when it comes to depression, it has a lot of uses when it comes to um, somebody who simply wants to explore their conscious and unconscious and understand more of how their mind and their emotions work. Like it can be incredibly powerful. One of the most powerful tools that I know of. If I could have only one tool um, beyond meditation and beyond breath work, 
still prefer those for many things. But beyond that, if I only have one tool that was outside of myself, it would probably be psilocybin. However, in my experience, it is not the most effective for, for PTSD. Um, if I'm just going to be bluntly honest, if PTSD or some unresolved trauma is at the core of what you're experiencing, then some of the other therapies that we have um, already covered, whether you're talking about non-medicine therapies like EMDR, um, or we're talking about medicine therapies, especially MDMA ther uh, therapy, um, that's definitely the direction that I would point you in to look there first to do the work with those or even just traditional therapy, like whichever ones really call to you, do those first. I personally believe in clearing out a lot of the emotional crud, if you will, the emotional blockages, the trauma, um, the, they can be called condensed emotional experiences. It's another word for them. Coex sometimes, hmm. but clearing that out before you move into the psychedelic realm. Because once you move into the psychedelic realm, your touch with reality um, can be lessened, sometimes completely disconnected for a period of time. And if you are in a state where you have a bunch of repressed emotions and then you move into a place where you're disconnecting from reality, that can be fucking terrifying. Like truly, truly challenging, terrifying. And it's not something I would want somebody to experience out of the gate which is why there are medicines, particularly for PTSD, trauma, coexes, whatever we want to call them. There are medicines and there are therapies that I personally believe are way more effective and where um, most, if, most people possibly, I wouldn't say all because it's never an, an all thing, but most people should start. Yeah. So once again, um, we want to get at the, at the root cause of the issue not just relieve the symptoms, okay? So yeah. that's that's part of the uh, the message we're trying to give here. We want you to get at the root cause, not just alleviate the symptoms. If you wanna just yeah. alleviate the symptoms, there's plenty of uh, medications that your uh, therapist can just uh, you know prescribe you and you can go throughout your day on opioids or whatever it is they're prescribing at the time, um, where those could uh, easily um, be sufficient to reduce the symptoms. Um, what we are trying to do here with uh, with a lot of the uh, uh, modalities that we presented is to try to get to the core so that you don't have the symptoms and perhaps you're chipping away at the uh, at the actual issue, right? So we want you to be better and not uh, dependent on having to buy uh, psilocybin, you know, um, every month to fill your script. It's not how it works. We want you to, we want you to go through the therapy. We want you to do the psilocybin if you choose to, and hopefully it's a, it's a limited um, therapeutic modality for you where you don't have to come back to it on a regular daily basis, where it doesn't have to be part of your medication regime. Um, we just want you to be better not just symptom free. Okay. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I, I truly believe with all of these, again, it's the intention. It's what you said. It's what you do with them while you're in that experience. You're in a malleable space where, um, like neural pathways and the brain can be reformed. It's a very powerful place, but if you're not using that space intentionally or doing something with it or exploring with it or changing and creating new patterns, quite honestly, you're, you're wasting an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and JG is asking, uh, is all psilocybin the same, i.e. are there differences in types, species, quality, etc.? Well, there are thousands of them, right? Yeah. yeah thousands yeah, yeah. of mushrooms out there. Um, Chris knows a few names. I don't know that many names. I know psilocybin, right? Yeah. Um, they, they, they go by a few different names. You'll hear them. Um, and they do have different levels. Here's the other thing. And, and one of the another reason that I personally believe in uh, the... Um, legalization and for therapeutic purposes, the regulation of uh, these types of, of medicines, right? Um, I still believe that for ceremony, for ritual, for all those things, we talk, look at indigenous rituals and everything else, like, like they should be free and be able to be used for that 100%. Um, but when it comes to the therapeutic setting, um, one of the challenges can be is not just from mushroom to mushroom. You have golden teacher, you have B plus, you have uh, penis envy is another one. They have wildly different amounts of the active ingredient psilocybin depending on it. So a gram of one is not a gram of the other. 
The other thing is, depending on how you've grown the mushrooms, how long they've matured, what that particular batch is, uh, you can have differences as well. So uh, mushroom to mushroom, even within the same species, um, can have different amounts of psilocybin. The type of the, the, the part of the mushroom that you eat, you know, whether you're looking at the stem or the cap, can have a different amount in it, right? So um, you really need to have an understanding of how this particular um, batch, if you will, works with your biology to know what dosages might be right. And as we start to get into more therapeutic and regulated settings, then what they're doing is they're um, essentially testing for all of that so that, you know, one pill that is equal to X amount of grams is the same amount of active substance as the next one would be. Kind of like when you look at cannabis and how they've begun to regulate like all of the edibles and if you have one gummy, it's the same as this gummy, it's the same as this gummy, same as this gummy, right? Um, so all of those are worth knowing and understanding. And thank you, JJ, for that question. Mm -hmm. Comp 360. <clears throat> so scientists have now developed a synthesized formula of psilocybin. No more digging under them cow patties, I tell you. Uh, this is called Comp 360. A rigorous large-scale clinical development program of COMP360 psilocybin therapy for treatment-resistant depression is currently going on across Europe and North America. If you would like to learn more about COMP360 and would be interested in participating in that therapy, please visit, and this is a long URL, https, semicolon, forward slash, forward slash, compasspathways.com, forward slash, our dash research, forward slash psilocybin dash therapy, forward slash about dash psilocybin dash therapy, forward slash. Now, again, these guys are looking for people that have uh, in um, depression and would like to try psilocybin, okay? They're still doing research. If you go to that website, you can actually sign up for it, right? You may have to travel a little bit, but if you are um, in need, and would like to find out if this is a safe way to go. These guys are doing it right. Uh, again, they're doing research, but they're doing research on the their formula for psilocybin, not actual so, mushrooms, but a synthesized um, version of it. And what do it? Yes. Wait, before we jump into that, this is something that we're going to see more and more of. So I just want to highlight this. Um, we are entering what many are calling like the, the a new psychedelic revolution. So right. it's just a lot of medicines that are being used and finding new purposes for them and finding better protocols to be able to use them to truly heal people. Um, because now we have companies and a lot of um, investment money and everything else moving into this, you know, one of the challenges with standard psilocybin, if you would, is that it's not a patentable or, um, uh, chemical. Right. It's a natural chemical and you can't patent it. Same way you can't patent uh, cannabis. But you're going to see more and more companies coming up with their own proprietary versions of these molecules and chemicals um, that may have um, different effects and may be more specialized and actually treat certain um, uh, afflictions even better. Uh, but that also means that then they can patent it. Then they can put it under some type of brand and then they can also like, you know, charge what they will for it. So there's a, a, a double edged blade that's coming with a lot of the, the um, psychedelic research that's coming down the, the lanes. I have a friend who runs a company in this space and they're patenting a particular psychedelic molecule. Um, and again, their purpose for doing it is because it provides substantially better effects for certain types of therapies. Um, and I know he's coming at it from a good place. I know he's coming at it from like the, the right energy in the right place. However, it's going to be really interesting to see how this develops over the coming years in terms of, you know, does this become a product of pharma, if you will, and the, the whole pharma industry, you know, think with that as you will. I particularly am not the fondest of our pharma, pharma industry, or will it be able to maintain some of the freedom that comes with utilizing free and open substances um, that are natural and, you know, anybody could grow given the legality of it. Right. Well, on the positive side, if pharma does take uh, some of this is uh, you're going to probably get the exact same amount of psilocybin yep. from one pill to the other uh, versus like you were stating earlier, uh, if you eat the wrong part of the mushroom and it may have uh, more, it may have less. Uh, there's really no, no way to, 
uh, regulate something that happens uh, naturally. And uh, JG is asking us a question. He says, as a, psycho as a psychedelic substance, how does psilocybin differ from the more well-known LSD? Hmm. Hmm. Well, LSD did come from plants initially, right? Those, those chemicals, the, the chemical LSD, don't ask me what it stands for, uh, was extracted and then synthesized, much like this COMP360 is currently being synthesized. So from a chemical standpoint, um, both, both psilocybin and LSD come from naturally occurring uh, vegetation. Um, as, as far as what is the difference between uh, LSD and psilocybin, you know, I'm not too sure that the, there's any LSD that's grown naturally or that you can eat any vegetation that has LSD, uh, no. that you could eat enough of it to, to, to get the same uh, trip, if you would, um, from, um, you know, uh, the synthesized liquid form that is, is currently out there. Uh, yeah, any so if I, if, if I may, um, so like LSD re refers to the synthetic version of the chemical. It's like, like lysergic acid, I always... Uh, forget exactly what it stands for. Um, they're similar in some ways. Um, there might be, I don't know if there's an overdose amount of LSD or not, so I don't want to comment on that and give any wrong information. See, I always um, think of the uh, don't eat the brown acid or, or, or whatever it is that uh, that happened in Woodstock or something like that, that announcement. I think it was during the Just Say No era we were shown mm. videos of, of why you shouldn't do drugs. And it was, I, I do remember uh, like a, a little Woodstock clip having to go onto the microphone and telling people to not take the brown acid. The brown acid is bad because people were having bad trips on it. And I'm just like, well, you know, that's, that's probably the color of poop. Why would you want to take it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that one. I actually have never heard that before. Never but, heard that? Uh, no. Like LSD is, is more po potent, like, you know, by weight, substantially more than psilocybin is. Um, the experiences are similar in that they are both psychedelics and they can both promote visuals or syn syn synesthesia, right? That's like kind of like um, hearing colors or uh, seeing sounds, that type of stuff. That sounds um, trippy. <laughs> <laughs> they both give you access to the unconscious. They can both take you on spiritual experiences, um, but they are different experiences. Um, it kind of like, uh, what's a good analogy that I could, could use? Um, kind of like getting drunk on beer is different from getting drunk on tequila. Like, you know, it's kind of like that, but not quite. Um, they're, they're, they take you to a similar place, but they feel different. So to another way of describing it is in my body, for example, um, psilocybin always felt more natural. And there was something about uh, LSD that felt digital, that felt um, powerful, helpful, gave me some incredible insights to patterns and challenges that I had in my life. Um, but didn't really feel that natural to me. It felt almost a little uncomfortable. And now I've, hmm. I know um, other people who've had it and don't have that same experience. Everybody and everybody uh, are different, right? Um, so similar but different is how I would describe it now. And we can, when we get to an episode on on LSD, we can go more deep as to what that experience is. Well, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. And what to expect during psilocybin therapy if you decide to uh, partake in one of these studies. Uh, one, preparation. So site and setting, right? Um, in the first preparation sessions, the therapist and patient get to know each other and form a trusting relationship so that the patient can feel supported and at ease during the psilocybin session. You want somebody that makes you feel comfortable, right? If you're not comfortable with your therapist, pick another Don't therapist. Do it. Yeah, exactly. Get another therapist like this is even more so with psychedelics than it is in just your standard therapy. In both cases, if you don't feel comfortable or you don't trust them, find another one. Find another um, one. But especially because you're going to enter into, you know, a psychedelic and a vulnerable state. And so definitely make sure that there's trust there. Yeah. Uh, the psilocybin session, uh, the patient li uh, lies down on a bed uh, in a comfortable room. Uh, designed specifically for the session. They receive a dose of psilocybin in a capsule. Uh, during the experience, patients listen uh, to specially uh, designed music 
uh, or music playlists. My understanding is uh, no words you can understand, maybe in, if there are lyrics uh, in another language. We want it to be soothing, not that you're, uh, and, and to make it so that your mind doesn't try to follow along. I think that's, that's my understanding of that. Um, let's see, uh, you're gonna wear an eye mask to help focus uh, internally. Uh, this little side of an experience, much like uh, uh, other experiences out there, it lasts for six to eight hours. This is reminding me of MDMA. Uh, a therapist and an assisting therapist are present throughout the session. Uh, the integration, patients are encouraged to discuss their experience uh, in, while, they're in your, while you are in your psilocybin session. Um, the goal is for patients with guidance from their therapist to generate their own insights. They're not going to put you know, words in your mouth or going to put thoughts in your head. You're supposed to be generating these on your own uh, and ideas from the experience to change unhelpful emotional and behavioral patterns. Yeah, so um, often the integration is where many of the benefits come from in terms of the, the long-term psychological changes, right? Yeah. So you come to an awareness, you realize something, you're still in this malleable state, and you are more able to take actions, to change habits, to create new habits, to create new patterns, even thought patterns. And then you reinforce those over the coming you know days and weeks to have a new way of being. Um, so integration in all of these therapies is incredibly important. Don't just, it's not just take the magic pill and you wake up better. Like they're, um, what you put into it is going to strongly reflect what you get out of it. Yeah. It's not a one and done folks. It is not a one and done. You, you still have a long way to go. You may have done, a, you might have done a lot of progress in those six to eight hours, uh, but it's definitely not one and done. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, any other words you have, Chris, on psilocybin? Yeah, so uh, uh, JG just put up another question. Let's answer that, and then we'll, we'll jump cool. in from there. Look at that. I'm slacking on my end. So uh, are the psychedelic effects in your mind's eye like a dream, or do people experience them with uh, your literal eyes like seeing ghosts? Uh, both. So under uh, lower dosages of psychedelics, um, if you open your eyes... You don't really see a lot, though there can be effects. I'll get into that in a moment. But if you close your eyes, it's like it's it, you're entering often a dream state. And you can experience a dream state. Um, and you can like fully experience that particular realm. Uh, and then with your eyes open, you can have a variety of experiences. You know, um, There have been times that for whatever reason, as I look around, it's like almost I see like little circuits on everything. Or particular, you'll, you'll see people get fascinated by certain things. Um, like there's a, there are some walls that look completely normal in your normal everyday state. But if you look at them when you're on a psychedelic, it's like you can see them continually moving, right? And it, it can be fascinating. And so the, the psychedelic experience, especially in terms of the, the dream state, depends on your dosage, depends on, on um, whether it's psilocybin alone or it's psilocybin in combination with something else, depends on uh, your sensitivity to it. And I believe that some people are more oriented to different sensations than another. So, for instance, Rod uh, tends to, and this is just in normal everyday life plus meditative states, Rod tends to visualize and see things way more clearly than I do. I have a tendency to feel things. And so I'm drawn often towards the sense of I feel a lot of stuff coming through rather than I'm seeing it. And how you are is going to be different. Again, everybody and everybody are different. Um, so there's not consistency there person to person, um, but it is both. It is like a dream and you can fault into and have the experience of being in that dream or under certain dosages, um, if you are, like, you know, more, um, uh, apt to have this type of experience, you can see things, um, out in normal life as well. And JG uh, continues on. It says, for therapeutic purposes, is the eye closed experience more recommended than the eyes open? So this is about intention, right? The same thing, if you look back at the last episode we did on, on MDMA, the typical protocol for that is to have an eye mask on and everything else. The reason for that is it's very easy with any experience that you're having to be fascinated by all the things around you. 
right? And essentially, you're directing your conscious energy. You're directing your mind outward. Oh, that's fascinating. Oh, look at that. Oh, my God. Look at that. Oh, did you see that thing move? Like, like and, and you're not going into yourself, right? You're essentially focusing your energy outside of yourself. Whereas if you're using this for therapy, often the main purpose of it, it's not the only main purpose, but often the main purpose of it is to go internal and to um, have clarifying or emotionally releasing or um, some other type of conscious experience that helps you uh, move forward in your life in a better way. And one of the best ways to do that is just to have uh, a blindfold over your eyes so that you're focused on your internal experience rather than being focused on the external. This is also one of those little hacks that helps with meditation. Uh, if you're having a challenge with meditation, um, there's often two different types of, of neurology that are involved. Um, but for some people, if you put a blindfold on, it's actually easier to fall into meditation. For some other people, it's not. So it's not the case for, for everybody. But for, for some people, that right there and just having that covered will direct your attention internally and it becomes easier to focus in that way. So you're kind of hacking the body and using how the body and mind automatically work to make sure that it becomes an internal experience for the, um, uh, the therapeutic purposes. I did find that uh, uh, removing the blind would almost um, negate my experience. You know, it's like, oh, this is real, that, that's not. But putting the blind back on, um, it allowed me to, to, to fall deeper into it, if you would. Um, yeah. And just kind of like keep, keep the session going. Uh, so yeah, I, I think for me, I needed the blindfold. Yeah, I, I, um, I can attest as well that at certain dosages, it no longer matters. <laughs> like there are places you can go to. Okay. So, uh, this, is, uh, this is now just purely as a, a, a funny experience that, that Mr. Plow will share. Um, there's uh, multiple psychedelic mushrooms out there. Another one is Amita muscaria, I believe. I always, again, me and names. Um, but it is from Siberia. Uh, and it's uh, one of the mushrooms that uh, many people believe like Santa Claus and the coloring of Santa Claus comes to because it's very bright red with these little white spots, right? Um, and if you eat it, uh, for most people, it's like really rough on the digestive system. It Do doesn't feel good. So, so what the, uh, the shamans and the, the indigenous people uh, have learned to use it is one of two things. Um, either the shaman will eat it first and take that uncomfortable experience to himself and then he'll pee out um, uh, he'll just pee. And when he pees, his pee contains like the active ingredient that is uh, hallucinogenic, right? But it's been gone through his, his um, digestive system and it doesn't, it now no longer causes the intestinal distress or it causes or, another kind of distress <laughs> yeah, exactly. or um, uh, reindeers will uh, eat it. And then they'll, they'll literally capture the, um, the urine from the, the reindeer. And so I, I heard about all this, and somewhere in Mr. Plow's uh, early experimentation with understanding these medicines, um, I didn't realize that there was a difference between Amita muscaria and uh, standard um, psilocybin-oriented uh, mushrooms. So I figured I was going to have one of the deepest experiences, and I was ready for it, and, and ultimately ended up being a, a very incredible, insightful, very healing experience. However, <laughs> I took, um, I'm not going to use the exact amount, a large amount of mushrooms and then continued, uh, proceeded to uh, pee uh, out the, my first two peas, if you will, and drink those back in because I, uh, I thought that that was what I was supposed to do to have that particular experience. Mm. Um, here's what I can say. Um, number it. one, um, Drinking your own pee isn't nearly as bad as you think it might be. It's not that bad. Well, um, once you're in this, you know, thick of things. <laughs> but but also, like, like I think there's always something. It's like smelling your own fart. Like, I would rather drink my pee than somebody else's pee, right? So I think that there's a piece of that. Uh, the second bit is... Can you run it through a filter first, like a Berkey or something? Or 
No, no, dude. Like, it was just you're, you're there, right? Like, it, the, the, the most challenging part about it is that it's warm. Um, but yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> but but a little stevia to make it sweet. Yeah, exactly. A little stevia. Exactly. Can I can I get some uh, mangoes in this? Um, too cream, too sharp. How, however, it does contain the active uh, a psychedelic ingredient, and so that ended up being one of the deepest most heroic um and i hate that term uh, but i'll use it here you have something called a heroic dose with psychedelics often with mushrooms and it's like if you're heroic you take this much f that f that <laughs> because it is usually a, a, a huge amount that is often not necessary for people something i will say so so all jokes aside all jokes about me taking heroic doses and drinking my own pee and but having a truly life um, changing experience it truly was helpful for me. Um, what I will say is the most beneficial experiences I've had, and this is reflected in the research. The most beneficial experiences I've had are often on light to medium doses, because in those light to medium doses, there's enough of you present to be able to process and, and be able to be with the things. There are, especially if you go back to the shamanic roots or the indigenous roots or the, the ritual roots of using these medicines, there's reasons for large doses. And it often has to do with the letting go, the ego death, the surrender, deep spiritual experiences that were often part of rituals that were meant to take people into a new phase of life, like often into a manhood or often in preparation for death. Like fantastic uses of those. But when we're talking about therapy. We're talking about depression. We're talking about anxiety. We're even talking about emotional uh, challenges and disorders that this can be helpful with. The small to medium doses are often way more effective for people than trying to go large, you know, go big or go home. F the go big or go home stuff. That type of attitude towards these medicines is not helpful. And uh, let's see, uh, JG is asking us, uh, with your eyes closed, is there any chance of falling asleep instead of going through your therapy? Well, um, my guess is if you're really tired, perhaps, but uh, having experienced some of it, I'm not sure I could have fallen asleep if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. If anything, it almost, it had a caffeinated effect to it where I became hyper aware of all my surroundings once the therapy was uh, done. Uh, I was very calm. I was very, uh, very one with the universe, if you would, but I was very aware. Yeah. So where this, this ties in. Um, so it's not like caffeine in that you're like, ah, I gotta go. No, but no. Where, what's happening neurologically, um, which is really fascinating when you start to look at psilocybin. I, I love this stuff. I'm endlessly like, like um, fascinated by it. So when you, you do something like psilocybin, um, the way it works is uh, your brain has a particular way of operating. And it's usually like this part of the brain talks, this part of the brain talks, this part of the brain, etc. cetera. Um, but it's not all highly interlinked. It's like different pieces are tend to be communicate more and more with others. When you're having the psychedelic experience, two things happen. One is the frontal portion of the brain tends to get less blood and less activity. And that's the portion that is usually identified with I, the ego, my needs. This is what I think. And so that part of you that is doing that takes a bit of a back seat. That's one of the reasons that the experience can feel transcendent and more connected to everything around you. It's because the part of the brain that is separating you from that, saying I and everything else, just gets powered down a little bit. That can be really helpful. The second thing that happens is parts of the brain that don't normally communicate start communicating like crazy. And so you end up, that's why it can be like very creative or you can start to do things like you can taste colors um, is because parts of the brain that don't normally connect are talking together and connecting. That is one of the theories around why it's helpful for certain um, uh, emotional or depressive disorders is because it's allowing for a greater amount of interconnection and it's kind of like rewiring the brain or like resetting parts of the brain that haven't been connected or, or as active in a while. Um, but you literally see the whole brain, except for that portion that is controlling the ego, the I, the separateness. You see it all like light up. Like, I mean, like massively light up. It's pretty incredible if you see the brain scans for it. And so it doesn't feel like your brain's on overdrive, at least in my experience. It's not like, ah, 
but it's like you become aware of so much more. I think a movie that captured a bit of this, but it's not completely realistic, is Limitless, right? Where like he takes the NZ-17 or whatever the, the pill is, and everything just seems to make more sense. He's aware of more things at, at one time, like the colors get a little brighter, like all of that stuff going on. That is a massive exaggeration of, of a psychedelic experience. Um, and it's not like it's going to turn you into some superhuman genius, but you literally become aware of so much more because more of the brain is turned on working um, simultaneously and interconnected during that psychedelic experience. Right. And, um, um, and I, I should have written a slide for this one. I, I did not, I apologize. Um, the effectiveness of it uh, from my research that I, that I did is um, research on research. Uh, it was 67% effective uh, for depression. Uh, after the one year mark. And after the 16 month mark, that 67 unfortunately dropped down to 16%. And those were the only two numbers I was able to find as far as effectiveness. Now, does that mean that there is no possible help or cure for you? No, it just means that you might need another session or you might need to continue your talk therapy or your other modalities in order to keep um, as much as you can, uh, you know, um, from falling back into those depressive states. Yeah, so we're, there's there's a couple things going on. Number one is we're still at the beginning a lot of, of a lot of the research for this around different things. Like psilocybin is so highly adaptable and has so many uses that the amount of research that's going to be done over the next ten years will probably dwarf what's been done over the last fifty. Yeah, um, and so we're going to start to understand more of this and more of the use cases. That's that's number one on this particular list. Number two, um, as with any therapy, right, you're going to experience some type of relief, most likely. And in that space of relief, then what else are you going to do? What other therapies are you going to try? What other modalities? What are you going to do to get beyond the surface level, this is the challenge I'm having and, and get resolution to it, to getting down to the true core, the seeds, the root of way, where that emotional challenge is. Because then, again, it's like anything with a root. If you go after the root and you get there and you resolve the root, everything else that's affected by that gets affected and, and you know changed. And so I look at tools like this as being a facilitator to allow you to do deeper work via different modalities, including just standard therapy, and being able to get down and actually resolve root core issues to have a um, continual sustained shift in your life where you don't have to then continue the therapies thereafter. Yeah. And then the only other thing that I'll say, which is now we're shifting topics a bit, when we talked a little bit about microdosing early on, um, for some things uh, like uh, treatment resistant depression, for um, things that might be more uh, chemical based rather than just, uh, unresolved emotional experiences. Um, there has been anecdotal evidence, um, that I've witnessed in other people. So this is now secondhand. Like I know people whose lives have been severely, uh, benefit from this, I don't know, severely, um, tremendously benefited from this. Uh, and then that's using microdosing to, uh, essentially every so often, um, you know, every few weeks or uh, a month here, a month there to maintain the shift out of those treatment resistant depression states and to have a way past that that is non-addictive. Your life is better. You're not you know, going into a numb state. You don't have to continue to do it. There's no withdrawals. Um, some people have utilized microdosing in that way. And I believe, again, as we have more research that comes with this, you're going to see various ways of utilizing psilocybin. You're going to see the people um, and the protocols that are just purely microdosing based. Um, you're going to find the protocols that are therapeutic based. You're going to find the, the other ones that come in and are involving a therapy. And then we're going to get into some of the stuff that, that uh, like neuro linguistic programming or other integrative therapies to really use that open um, neurogenesis, like your brain is malleable and you can create new patterns state to create massive shifts 
that would normally take therapy years to do in the span of days and weeks and months. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, lastly, um, again, I always like to end with the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. To find a facility near you, uh, go to https uh, subicolon forward slash forward slash findtreatment.gov. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255. Uh, to, uh, to locate the behavioral health treatment locator, to locate the locator, uh, go to https uh, semicolon forward slash forward slash findtreatment.samhsa.gov. And the SMHSA National Helpline is 1-800-662-4357. So with this, uh, Josh has another question we'll get to in just one moment, but I just want to say this. Number one, you've heard me say this before. I'll say it many times again. If you're in that space where one of these helplines is uh, truly necessary for you, call them. If you won't call them for yourself, call them for somebody you know who loves and cares about you, whether that is a child, a sibling, a brother, a parent, a friend. If you don't feel like you have any of those, call them for us. Yeah. Like really take care of yourself. And then the second thing, just because we're talking about medicines and we're talking about how these things can be beneficial for depression, for emotional uh, trauma, for PTSD, uh, for suicidal tendencies, they can be helpful in resolving and working through the patterns that cause that. They're not something you necessarily want to take if you feel like I'm just going to be honest. If you feel suicidal, do not take these medicines. That is not the set, the setting, the intention, the space to be in as you start to go into a psychedelic space. That is quite likely to lead you to a very challenging, possibly traumatic experience. And so do not use them in that space. Set, setting, um, and intention are incredibly important. And so as much as you're able to, you want to be in a space where you feel even keel. You want to be in a space where you're not being challenged by um, emotions and thoughts and you know feel like you're in an unstable place. And you want to have the intention of going in and healing some, some spot about you or understanding something about you or integrating something about you. So choose carefully when and if you use these medicines and in all possible uh in any way that you possibly can engage somebody who knows these well shaman guide therapist whichever it might be that you have access to let somebody who has a tremendous amount of experience and who your gut trusts let them help you with this rather than just jumping in on your own yeah and feel free to call any of these numbers or look through their websites. Again, uh, if you're feeling agitated, this is probably the better way to go. Don't, yeah. don't, don't try any of these modalities if you are in an agitated state. Yep. All right. And JG is asking us, when in therapy, what is the job of a therapist? Do they direct your experience or do you primarily let, uh, let you have your experience and provide you with a sense of safety and calm? So it depends on the therapy. Um, we were actually having a, a good call on this the other day and, and talking it through more deeply. The traditional um, view of what the therapist or the guide or even the, the shaman might do is they're there to provide a safe space. They're there to help you relax fully into it. They're there to let you let down your fears and your guard and enter into what can feel like and, uh, a very open, sometimes vulnerable space, right? And you're having your experience. There may be times when there's some guidance given, especially if you ask a question. Um, there might be times when some intuitive question is asked by them, but very often it's just you're having your experience and they're making sure that you feel cared for, you feel safe, you feel all of those things. However, there are some therapies on February 18th um, I'm having my first session with a very different uh, guided therapy that is intended to help with releasing 
stored emotional experiences and trauma from the base nervous system. It's very specifically targeted at that. And that is an experience that is very much guided. So rather than just you know, Chris having his own experience, the therapist involved with that is very specifically trained and is going to guide me through the entire experience in order to get at um, what might be stored within the nervous system to allow for a greater sense of um, of ease, of peace, of tranquility, um, essentially allowing the nervous system to move down to the complete calm state um, of zero rest and digest. So the therapies available to you are going to differ. 80 to 90% right now are you're having your own experience and the therapist is there to make sure that you're safe and afterwards to go through the integration process with you. However, we're still in this place where everything is being explored, where new things are coming in, new protocols are being tested, they're being created, they have different purposes. And so you're going to see a whole variety of offerings come up over the next few years. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I'm trying this new modality in February is because one, I know that I'm going to benefit from it. I just feel it in my bones. I'm going to benefit from it. And I want to be able to be able to bring that experience back to you guys and give you like, like the options of what was different about it. Where might this help you? And where would this fit within your own um, healing regime, um, healing protocols, your own toolkit, if you will, as you're finding your own path forward? Thank you. And with that, I want to thank everybody out there for joining us this evening. Um, if you enjoyed uh, what you saw, please share us with your friends. Uh, point them our way. We'd love to uh, hear from more people and have some more viewers out there. Um, if you're interested, uh, join me again next week. Uh, same bad time, same bad channel. Uh, Chris is going to be doing some adventures uh, out of the country. So good luck with that, sir. Uh, and we will see the rest of you next week. Have a good night. All right. Big love.